Tonight, you'll hear a very distinguished panel in a lively and often heated discussion. The panel consists of Marshall McLuhan, the head of the Center for Culture and Technology at the University of Toronto, W. H. Auden, perhaps the most illustrious poet in English today, Buckminster Fuller, inventor, architect, and thinker, and Jack McGowan, Irish actor and foremost interpreter of the plays of Samuel Beckett. Ideas recorded them at the fourth annual seminar in Irish studies held recently at the University of Toronto. The ostensible subject of their discussion is theatre and the visual arts. But, as you'll hear in a moment, that topic is soon forgotten, as two modes of perception clash. That of Professor McLuhan, who is one of the most famous interpreters of contemporary 20th century cultural trends, and that of W. H. Auden, who cheerfully admits to being a 19th century man and sees no reason to change. Professor Norman Jeffers, a Yates scholar and editor of Yates Collected Works, who is chairman of the English department at Leeds University in England, is in the chair. Perhaps we might begin by asking Mr. Auden, when he writes a play, whether he wonders what it will look like on the stage, and whether he has views about it, or whether they are realized by producers or not. I have to begin by saying that I, I, I don't regard myself really as a playwright. I regard myself as a, a writer of opera and a recce. Uh, of course, they're both uh, dramatic works. But um, uh, when you, uh, 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 obviously, when you are writing something, you have an idea of how you think it should look, but one isn't a profession, one hands it over to a stage designer. I must know it isn't right. My collaborator, Mr. Chess Gorman, and I uh, did a, a, a libretto for Hunt Van, Van Hensen based on the Bacchae of Euripides. Well, we did have then a scenic idea, uh, which is that um, the clothes that people are wearing can be a verbal shorthand uh, for their character. So that we, we planned, and I'm glad to say our, our stage design agreed with us, that, for example, um, uh, uh, Pentheus uh, looked like uh, one of the sort of medieval Catholic uh, monarchs. Um, Theresias was to look like an Anglican archdeacon. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Cadmus was just look like a fairy story, okay, I mean, hundreds of years old. Um, and when you really saw the, uh, the, uh, the mean of course, we changed it to, to, uh, from women only to double thing, then they had to look like beets. <laughs> and it worked, mm. that's all I could say, <clears throat> and the our stage designer knew this, uh, which I, I mentioned similar to how one does visualize certain things when one's writing. Mm. Marshall, would you like to comment on that in the light of your views of what happens today? Mm. Well, the idea of putting on masks, power, energy, corporate masks, it's um, a very large subject, and um, clothing as language is one that I'm sure that we have an actor here of, who could tell us a good deal about, Mr. McGowan. I should like to hear Mr. McGowan's uh, views on the interpretive powers of costume. Yes, well, I'm in agreement uh, to this degree, that costume as well as uh, setting, design, and direction uh, are all, in fact, part of a basic rule in that they are aids to an actor and no more. And as such, should be simple and unobtrusive. Yeah, um, yeah. They should never try to say, Look at this costume, look at my direction, look at my setting. All these things, including lighting, are all there to serve the purpose that is the actor and the spoken word. 
which are the most important things that the public have come to see and hear. Uh, you know, you've heard the phrase, they came away humming the sets. Well, <laughs> this has been a fault of many of our scenic designers in that they are uh, too prone to show their skill at uh, designing a set which overwhelms the actor to yeah. such a degree that he is obscured and the set is far too elaborate. And I personally uh, am involved in a theater and will always be involved in a theater where the emphasis is on simplicity. I think we should at that point ask Mr. Buckminster Fuller how he is tackling this problem because he is starting as it were from scratch to design a theater in Oxford. In the first place, I, I never have, a, never before designed a theatre. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so it's really a very exciting venture for me. But I, I think uh, at Oxford we were being interviewed by a newspaper about what the theatre was going to look like, how people would feel in it. And I said, uh, if anybody even noticed my theater, I thought, think I'd be a failure. My, my determination really is to sublimate completely the, my structuring. And uh, that, that, I'd say, is the very essence. It, uh, the, uh, the Oxford Theater is, is a very small one. Samuel Beckett had very strong ideas of what he wanted. And uh, he wanted to have great uh, versatility of presentation so that it will be able to do, uh, do the theater at the proscenium, it'll have to be able to do the Greek, and have to be do the, the uh, in the round, and be uh, changeable from one to the other, again, without making people feel this. I don't have any feeling of mechanics at all. Mm. And uh, furthermore, the Oxford Theater has a very special requirement. It has to be underground. Mm. The, uh, the city of Oxford and the university have, uh, have uh, decided that there no building should be above the ground, uh, except, <laughs> except, 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 except uh, the dormitories for, for the students to live in. They're so crowded today, so that we, are, we have to put it under the quadrangle of the, of the college. <laughs> does that also mean underwater? And it also does mean underwater. Yes. Right. So it, it's going this to be... Is it's going to be a, this it'll, is sublimation. It'll be... It'll be, a, it'll be a, <laughs> I sure it'll be a... It'll be a submarine sublimation. <laughs> Well, now, I would like to ask Martin McLuhan, if I may, how he sees the theatre in our terms. Here is a theatre being built underground. I think he has views of the theatre as being something which also takes off a little bit from the ground. We've just seen Apollo 14, which has some visual effects going with it. Mm. It's a new type of theatre, obviously. And um, there is another very observable form of theater, namely student activists, as they present themselves in new settings and uh, new with uh, new scripts, and um, as they call in the new media to assist their presentations. Since uh, Sputnik, the planet has gone inside a man-made environment of satellites, and uh, this makes everything on the planet simultaneously present to consciousness. They call it ecology. But when everything happens at once, and everybody is involved, there is no audience. There are only actors. I think this is a new dimension of the electric theater. The role of uh, the audience as actor, I think, is worth watching. And it might be possible to have comments from the panel on the varying degrees in which the audience has participated in the action in the past in theater. I suppose the mouse is the greatest form of theater possible and is the one in which the audience is necessarily participant, in which there is no audience. I'm afraid, Mr. Colonel, that I profoundly disapprove. 
<laughs> of artists, uh, of audience participation. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I know it's your, going your, audience, your audience is participating. Uh, I now. know. No, uh, I think <laughs> that uh, the, 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 the whole point when I go to the, uh, go to the theatre is that I look mm. and I, I don't take part in the action, I observe. And this to me is, is, is I, mean, I know what goes on now, and I think it's an appalling uh, lack of distinction in the, the public and the private life. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, people take off their clothes in public now on the stage. Well, that's the thing, one does privately, one does the sort of thing. It seems to be very, very important. I, 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 I'm profoundly conservative on this point. Uh, that, uh, I, I, I mean, that's why, I mean, this terrible thing that happened, for example, with TV is that it turns all historical facts into fiction. So that, you know, people show um, uh, films of people being blown up in Vietnam. People roll with laughter. It's all part of a film. And this frightens me very, very much indeed. I mean, it's not what the people intend, but I think it's a very, I think TV is a very, very wicked medium, that's all I can say. The, uh, do you feel, do you feel, I, I'm, inter I'm interested in this because I have steadfastly reserved moral judgment on all media matters. I think. The, 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 the telephone, the telephone is a very wicked instrument, by all, of course, but not as bad as the motor car. Uh, I, these uh, extremely and execrable uh, and malignant forces in our midst, I am quite aware of. In fact, I have studied them very, very carefully. But I am also aware that one of the greatest dramas of our time is man hunting. For sure. Now, this is um, a hidden drama, but it does provide an enormous amount of entertainment in many media. In your own work, Mr. Otten, you have spent much time exploring the ways in which our new culture in this century destroyed the unconscious and destroyed, the, or rather pushed the unconscious up into the private psyche, destroying private identity. I don't think so. The destruction of... <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 the, simple, the simple process by which the unconscious was pu pushed up into consciousness by, with the help of electricity, Freud and Jung, is a, one of the big dramas of our time. And it's true, the private identity, the private individual, has been swept aside by this huge surge of the unconscious up into consciousness. It, it's not how I feel about things. I know I'm rooted in the 19th century. But and, I'm... Um, are you expressing preferences or observations of fact? Uh, what I, <laughs> simply what I know about myself. I realize more and more as I get older uh, how rooted I am in the 19th century. I mean, thank, I mean, thank God, you know, I can remember the world before World War I. And thank God I was brought up to know that I was a, a, a member of the upper middle class profession. I'm terribly grateful for this. No, this, um, this is a circumstance that is very theatrical. <laughs> it, it is part, part of your own mask that you use, the public school voice. <laughs> I mean, if, if I or if some Canadian were to put on the public school voice, he would at once appear as an actor on a stage. Well, I'm an officer. I have an Oxford accent. Though, of course, the English say I have a mid, mid Atlantic accent because I have to shorten my A. As an Englishman, I think you might have some very interesting things to say about language as mask, as an actor's mask. I, I, it, it's not, well, I think one of the things is when you're younger, you have to wear a mask. It's only the last few years I felt I could really speak in the first person. Um, genuinely. Because I think, you know, it takes a long time to find out who you are. Mm. And part of the way, I mean, uh, one of the things you are coming to America, for example, is that I agree entirely with what someone said, Mom said, in order to understand your own country, 
You have to live in these two others. Mr. Rodney, will you please comment on the relation of the English language and prosody to jazz and rock? I dare not think about them. Well, you hear them. You can't. You can't help it. I do. I, I don't have to hear them. But I live in a park in New York. Where I don't have to hear them. Ah, not you. You know, York. You are now in the city of York. Toronto is York. Yeah. And there is the University of York nearby, so you better clarify. You mean York, England? No, no I, I mean in New York. I, oh. I, I mean, I live at, ah. I, I live at, <laughs> and uh, I don't have to hear it. Oh, um, well, you're, you're very lucky. You can turn these things off. I don't have them on. Ah. Mm. But um, uh, even in air travel, you can, you can turn them off. Uh, well, there, there, there's the schmaltz music. They have on um, no. the uh, to try to quiet the nerves of people. I mean, don't uh, uh, poor old Mozart they and have, Bach. They don't have rock rock music on. Uh, poor old Mozart and Bach were the ro music of their day. No background okay. music. Uh, they were so. I mean, uh, the I mean, the Zvetimenti, for example, which obviously. Oh, the Goldberg uh, variations were were sleeping but, pills. Uh, but, uh, but but I don't have to hear the rock because. You can't, you can't miss it if you, uh, whether you try or not. Now, there is a very strange thing, Mr. Hardy. There's a very strange thing. Rock can only be sung in English. No other language on earth can carry rock rhythms. Really? Because as far as popular songs are concerned, I think German is a much better language. But it is not as able to carry rock rhythms. Um, no, I'm sure it isn't. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I like um, German uh, lyrics like, each sits up their bar and have a kind of mm. And to our now, ears, you know, I, sit on the bar, I sit at the bar and I have mm. no money. Mm. This I appreciate. I don't know if the audience has noticed, but more and more people are now ready to talk about their dreams. And this may well be a return mm. to the kind of stability. Oh, but my God, how boring <laughs> one feels. Ah. <laughs> They're boring the same way the lunatics are. I happen to be thinking about this, so I have to give a Freud Memorial lecture <laughs> in the game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but nothing seems to me less interesting about dreams. Nothing even less more inartistic um, than a dream, because they're actually formless. Or rather, also repetitious. I've only once mm. in my life had a dream that I thought was sufficiently interesting to write down. Um, and it's not. <laughs> <laughs> would, well, you, would you venture to commit it to the oral tradition? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I wonder could we ask Mr. McGowan how he feels about audience participation. Does he feel this is an infringement on his trade union, or would he define the kind of participation he would like from an audience? Well, I draw the call of involvement uh, rather than participation. Uh, and, then, and, you know, theatre remains still the only three-dimensional medium we've got. Every other media is two-dimensional, and as such doesn't require an audience at all. But it's vastly different playing to a camera, whether it be television or a cinema or a radio to a microphone, than playing to a live audience from which there is a direct connect uh, response and feeling and an indeterminate <clears throat> mystique which I can't explain but uh, I am very concerned about uh, uh, an audience's involvement with what is happening in the on the stage uh, an actor gets a, a very keen awareness after a number of years as to whether the audience are being involved in what he is doing or saying. And this involvement, I think, is particularly important to theatre. Uh, and without it, uh, I don't think actors could have this extra dimension that the theatre needs. You think rather well don't you, uh, about television as a means of education for the world. Okay. But do you think that we have 
too passive an audience in television which can be acted on. I find, I don't know if other people share this today, but so many people don't actually listen to what you say. But I think that you do find quite often in talking to someone that they have taken in about a third. And the rest of the time, no doubt, they've been watching the visual that you've presented mm. to them. But their ears have got a little mm. deaf in this curious way mm. they're selected to. Right. Talking, you about, that? talking about that, you know mm. what happens with, uh, with tape recorders? Because mm. I know uh, Truman Capote was being interviewed mm. on the tape recorder. The tape recorder broke down. So he said, well, all right, we go on. Oh, but I'm not used to this thing what you say. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. McGowan might be interested in the immediate prospect of four- and five-dimensional TV. That is, with the total image of the actor in the room, hologramic, they call it. This is an immediate, it is now an engineering fact, and this can be a popular, available kind of experience at any time in any home. But whether this will change acting and uh, the problems of the visual organization of theater is another question. I rather suspect that we are missing the game and not noticing how cinema has extended the bounds of theater globally, travelogue style. I don't think there's any part of the planet in which most people have not been and under sea as well as above the sea. Many times, every child, by the time he gets to school, has been with Castro under the sea into the most amazing territories. And uh, I'm not saying this is good or bad. It simply happens to all children today. They have, there is no world of fantasy they have not visited on television, Sesame Street, or animated cartoons, and so on. The extensions of language into gesture of a massive and extensive type is happening. I, I personally am not prepared as a private individual to make value judgments about anything that is so massive. I'm, I'm a, I, I really do think it does take a certain amount of 19th century egotism to confront uh, this massive thing with a private point of view. Well, I I, I agree. Yeah. You know, I do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is arrogant, but I am arrogant. Well, I, <laughs> good. And you, you think that you would you inculcate this as an attitude in others? Yes, I would. Good. <laughs> Please let me ask yes. Mr. McGowan, what is, does he think the Greeks might have done with PA systems if they'd had them? With PA systems such as we have here. Oh, they would have resented them very much because they placed they placed so much value on the power of uh, the vocal power, their own vocal power, to reach an audience from any part of the auditorium, and they would have <coughs> scorned, as opera singers today would scorn, the use of microphone. And uh, I think any actor personally, who uh, can produce vocally the effect necessary to uh, fill a theater would be deadly against the use of microphones yeah, yeah, yeah. or have to distort the voice in some way. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think if he has vocal equipment <coughs> to be able to reach an audience without the use of PA, yeah. then it's all better. Would yeah. they have shunned the gramophone and radio? Would they have turned them off? I'm perfectly prepared to say we ought to turn off radio and television today, now and forever. I mean, I'm perfectly prepared to make that as a practical political suggestion. Oh, I don't think we would miss it. <laughs> that is not practical. I wish it were. I think for survival. If I was a censor. For survival, uh, Mr. Ives, let me suggest uh, that not on moral grounds, but on survival grounds. Well, well, there's not so much difference between them. All right, I suggest that <laughs> I'm glad I heartily concur with Mr. Orton, but I do suggest that on more on survival grounds, we might well consider the need to turn off TV for good. 
got the power of television to upgrade the Oriental and Negro image, for example, to the point where it crushes the white image, is so tremendous that it can only result in a bloodbath. Because the white will not take it. I suggest, therefore, politically, if you want to save a fantastic bloodbath on this planet, which would be very dramatic and very cathartic and very tragic in the Greek sense, uh, I suggest we turn off TV totally. Is for good. Not, is it not too late? Yeah. No. I'm afraid for the past it won't happen. But uh, because of what it'll the, happen. The thing with TV is it's it marked about it, course. It's game. All I'm doing, Mr. Rodden, no. all I'm doing, Mr. Rodden, is up, one upping your value judgment. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, I don't think your value judgments amount to a hoot, because you are a 19th century man. Sure. And I um, am aware. So, and I think so I am aware. Because so are you. I am aware of 20th century actualities and. Well, I so am I, but I don't. No, you are. <laughs> I, I didn't say, I, didn't, I don't venture to approve or disapprove. I merely suggest that, you know, if you see, if you see a fire, you quickly try to douse it. When I see TV or these electric forms dissolving every aspect of human individual, I, I say, turn it off. But who's going to turn it off? They prefer to burn down. For sure. Well, they prefer. Uh, but uh, it doesn't mean, uh, I mean, it won't, uh, this won't happen. Not I'm not saying it'll happen. We're doing it to ourselves. And Nobody else not. is doing it to us. Exactly. All right. Then why won't it happen? Uh, because, because, because people like the damn thing. <laughs> okay. I mean, the children in the fiery furnace. Do you well, think? Do you think we can ape the children in the fiery furnace and enjoy the whole thing? Uh, well, I can, but uh, obviously they do. Uh, I mean, the thing, uh, uh, TV is marvelous for games. You can see a tennis match or something what? better than you, you are. You are, are, you, are no, you are missing the name of the game, sir. You are actually imagining that those little images you see on TV are TV. They are not. What is TV is that Feuerbach, fire stream pouring out of that tube into your gut. Yeah. Now, that is, is TV. Yeah. What you see on TV has nothing to do with TV. I'm talking about the actual physical injection yeah. of those fire particles into your insides. Exactly. Well, it's well, called an inner trip. Well, of course, I don't, I, I don't have a TV, and I wouldn't dream of having one. I know. But I'll that you, you merely suffer the consequences of TV mm -hmm. without enjoying it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I wouldn't enjoy it, I know, because uh, well, the one thing, for example, case uh, uh, names in England or in Europe, I can look at TV because, all right, I would like to see an old movie. Very mm. okay, good. Uh, but here it's so Silent. cut. Silent. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Here it's so cut with the commercial, you know, you can't enjoy it. And have you not learned to enjoy our commercials as art form? No, I, I know that if you're a real TV buff, you think the, the mm. commercial's the best thing. I, I know that. I know the people it's who the, it's the commercial it. people who produce Sesame Street. Mm, but uh, uh, it's not for me. Um, I think we have a, a feeling, obviously, on the part of the panel, which I think, <laughs> looking at the audience, may well be shared by a very large number of them also. And it really, I think, is that people have forgotten how to do nothing intelligently. <laughs> Now, here you will have four Grecians who are obviously very skilled at this, because they're very energetic, they produce a great deal, and the real answer is that they can fill their time by thinking. And I think what they're suggesting really is that the danger of television is that it fills time and allows people not to think. No. No? Well, well I, 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 I also fill my time by breathing. But that's not thinking, in a sense, the one is yeah, to think. But I never McLuhan. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 don't, uh, don't, uh, don't fall into that British habit of supposing that McLuhan is against the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, my dear, I'm sorry, it wasn't people to 
I didn't say you were against it, but you thought the time of the book was over. Obsolescence is the moment of superabundance. The book never had it so good. No. But it is no longer constitutive of the culture that we live in. Uh, the book will abound and superabound in the next few decades because it is obsolete. Uh-huh. Obsolescence is not extinction, it is superabundance. Uh huh. Well, I don't think it's obsolete. Well, I know, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I, I personally I make you. my living out of the book. Great. I make mm. my living, I teach it, I revere it, I study it, I study your work, sir. No, As a matter of fact, no, I have no, to no. give a lecture on you tomorrow morning. Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Yes, this will all be the best for me. <laughs> Theater and the Visual Arts. A discussion between Marshall McLuhan and W.H. Auden. Also present on the panel were Buckminster Fuller, Jack McGowan, and the moderator, Professor Norman Jeffers. The discussion was recorded at the annual University of Toronto Irish Studies Seminar and was edited for broadcast by Judy Stockman.